Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. I'm your host, Paula Jenkins. I invite you to join me as we explore how inspiring people have chosen joy in their lives and what they have to share with us about how to jumpstart joy in the world. Plus, how do we follow our own hearts, find work that lights us up while mindfully noticing the role joy plays in our own journey. Hello and welcome to episode 142. This is Paula Jenkins, the host of Jumpstart Your Joy. This week on the show, we are having a look back lesson, and that means we're going back to revisit a very memorable and exciting interview from the past. This week, I am going back to the conversation with Morgan Bolender. Morgan is a singer and songwriter and has an amazing CD. And she and I met at a Danielle Laporte event where she was the opening act for Danielle Laporte and performed her song, Mary Oliver, which you will get to hear later in this episode. Morgan and I talked about her amazing journey from going from being a special education teacher to then very literally finding her voice and exploring what it meant to to really pursue her passion which is that of singing and songwriting. And I think it's such an important story because so many of us will push aside that thing or we won't follow our hearts and go into something that seems a little bit scary just because it is uncomfortable to go into the unknown. And so I love Morgan's explanation about how she followed her heart and about how there were so many synchronous moments that showed up once she had started to say yes. And I think we all need that inspiration from time to time. And so that's why I wanted to pull this conversation back out and share it with you again this week. So if you are new, I want to say a big warm welcome to you. Um, thank you for listening to Jumpstart Your Joy. It is a weekly podcast that comes out Tuesday mornings, and it's been around since September 2015, so it's almost three years. I'm pretty excited about that. I'm Paula. I am your host, and the heart of this show is really exploring those moments where people kind of say yes they to joy. You know, they might be in the middle of a difficult time or you know, where joy actually seems like a really improbable choice, but people know that they want more from their life or they want to follow something that has woken up inside of them and said, hey, what about this? And so when they make that jump, that's the exciting moment. And that is what I love to focus on. So I feel like Morgan did that in a big way in this um, episode. You will learn more. If you want to find out more about Morgan, I do show notes for absolutely every episode, and you can find them for this one at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N, and you'll find it right there. It's also going to be on the homepage of jumpstartyourjoy.com this week. Also, if you like what you hear, I would love it so much if you would subscribe or share Jumpstart Your Joy with a friend that maybe could use a little oomph in their week. But you can find us on any of the major podcasting applications. So that includes iTunes, um, or as they call it now, uh, Apple Podcasts. Or we are on Stitcher and Google Play Music and Spotify as well. So any of those places that maybe you already listen to podcasts, we are there as well. Uh, Hit the subscribe button and leave a review. I would love to hear it. And then also while you're on the website. So without further ado, let's get on to this amazing conversation with Morgan. Well, welcome to the show today. I am so, so excited to have Morgan Bolander on. Oh, welcome to the podcast, Morgan. Hi, thanks. Good to be here. (laughs) So exciting. I so we first met back at the Danielle Laporte event back in uh, in San Francisco at Grace Cathedral, and I got to hear you perform, and I was like, oh my goodness, I really need to have a conversation with Morgan because you are mm. just really a delightful musician and, and so inspiring. So thank you for joining. Oh, that's so sweet to hear. Yeah, it's really <laughs> a pleasure to be here. Yay! What did you love most as a child or in school? What were your earliest sparks of joy? So I got up this morning and, or I saw the question late last night before going to bed and I was like, huh, I'm going to have to call my mom. Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I called her this morning. I was like, mom, like what? Um, and the first thing she said is what I thought she would say, which was uh, the name of my childhood and still one of my best friends. She was like, mm-hmm. Liz Tanko, spark joy. And I was like, 
Yeah, like definitely. And what what else? Like I don't really remember being super joyful. Mm. And we agreed that I was like a pretty introspective and like oddly serious child. Very, Mm. very serious. And ultimately we came to like, and I'm not like, I I wish I could say it was like flowers and music and all this, but it was like achieving things Mm. is what made me joyful. Um, So like learn, like understanding something I hadn't understood before or like learning yeah, how to do something or, and this is the one I'm like least proud of, but it's just like, was a fact and was like winning. Mm, yeah. <laughs> winning, winning things. <laughs> That's awesome um, though. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, again, I would much like, it would be much more romantic of a story. If I was <laughs> like, yes, like the single strum of a guitar chord just brought about a feeling of, you know, but no, <laughs> right. it was like, It was like, no, like climbing to the top the fastest. But then another thing that I thought about is uh, deep connection with other Mm. people. Like when I could find somebody who was willing and excited to dive as deep into conversation and connection as I wanted, it was really exciting for me. Yes. Oh, and I think right there is probably... One of the places that we would be complete kindred spirits is because I know I loved sitting. And if if there was that one friend, whether it was on the phone or like in person, that you could just be like, yeah, like, let's just pull this topic apart and then let the afternoon go or the evening or whatever it was. Like, yeah, that was that's deliciously Mm -hmm. joyful. Mm. Yeah. Like, let's talk ideas. And what, like, what's, what are we all doing here? And, (laughs) um, and then I had another um, best friend who is also still one of my very best friends. um, And we would be like, let's try to move things with our minds or Mm. like, let's sit with the Ouija board or like kind of more witchy stuff and just being like, okay, so there's like a whole, like, I think there's a whole other world beneath, above, around, within whatever, like what, what it is we're presented with as being mm-hmm. reality. So like, let's explore that. Oh, yes. I love all that. And it's so interesting to me because I mean, I can, I can see from only having spoken to you for a very few minutes. It's like, I could see that person that was so kind of introspective, but loved all the connections and like believed that and very strongly knew that there was something way beyond this plane of existence. Like I can totally see how those things really? tie through. Oh yeah. To to like even oh, so nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> to your songs. Like that's that's almost exactly what uh, at least some of what I just adore about it is you have this beautiful connection that you that you make in your your songwriting and your singing that I feel is so well communicated through with what you just said you love. So I don't know if you also want to then share with us, what is it that you do now? Music. I do full-time music. So I did this really big tour over the summer, Mm -hmm. which, yeah, it took an incredible amount of planning. It was three months and a week and just about 50 concerts. And they were all house concerts, which totally ties in like my love for connection and community. And yeah, it was 13,000 miles all around the country. Mm. So I just got back from that, like coming on a month ago, but I feel like I'm still landing. Yeah. And um, yeah, then I'm, I'm doing local house concerts around here and I'm on the cusp of beginning a group for women, at least to start, it'll be women for like freeing your voice. Mm. Um, So like a five or six week workshop. Oh, yeah, that sounds really, really super interesting. So I want to get the details for people to find out more about that. Because, well, so for the tour, that sounds intense, but um, also so interesting. I know I saw a YouTube video of you singing with your partner. Mm hmm. And wow, you guys are pretty magical together. The Molten Aww. Sky song was like, oh my gosh, I had to hit, the, you know, listen a couple times on um, the one YouTube video I found. How do you guys go about creating music? Uh, what is that process like for you? Well, we've written two songs together. They are both joke songs. <laughs> one of them, <laughs> one of them is called Booty Patrol, and the other one's called I'm a Baby, and they're ridiculous. So both of us on our own write these like pretty introspective and often like serious 
songs. And then it, it was really funny to see that when we came together, we wrote these like outrageous comedy songs. But we're wanting to dive more deeply. I mean, we first hung out with the thought of like, hey, let's try and write a song together. And um, Scott's been playing guitar and songwriting for what, like 18 years now. And for me, I sang my first note and strum my first chords about six years ago. Like oh, I didn't wow. sing, I didn't do anything musical except for a little bit of violin when I was a kid mm-hmm. until six years ago. But yeah, we're definitely wanting to write more together. And it's like, it's like such an incredibly personal and tender art that mm-hmm. there's a lot, you know, there's kind of, I think a lot of ego stuff to get through. Sure. And to be able to just throw around ideas and write together. And we're, I mean, we're partners beyond just music mm, also. Okay. So, yeah, we're just like very, very close. And yeah. I feel like that, you know, I think we both care a lot about what the other thinks. And we have our own, you know, we have our own internal like power dynamics and all of these things that would come with us into the space of trying to write a song together. Mm-hmm. And it's something that I know we're both excited about. This hasn't been ripe yet. So for our collaboration, for his songs, I often play percussion and sing harmonies. And then for mine, he often plays guitar along and sometimes sings harmonies. Mm-hmm. So we've been collaborating in performance, but not as much in writing. That's very cool. And I love that you're leaving the space, kind of acknowledging that you both have your own process and kind of leaving space for whatever that means and how you best create music together. I could sense there would be a lot to navigate doing anything with yeah. another person. <laughs> you kind of got to figure it all out in, a, in its own way every time. So yeah, that's neat. Totally. Um, so how did you start? How did you get your start with music? You said six years ago. How did, how did that come about? I said there's a great, great story there too. Oh my goodness. This one gets like kind of trippy. After college, I went to Kona, Hawaii to work as a third grade special education teacher through a program called Teach for America. At this, the program required that I was also at the same time a full-time graduate student. So mm-hmm. full-time teacher, full-time first year teacher, full-time graduate student. And also in that program, um, you're not required to have had a degree in education. So I'd had five weeks of teacher training, intensive, one hour maybe of special ed training. And then I was in a classroom and in, a, in an underserved community. And within, after about three months, I woke up one day, just like I woke up to myself crying and was just like, I hate this. Like, I hate my life right now. This is not, I don't like teaching. I don't like the routine of it. I don't like, you know, having, encouraging these kids to sit and do an hour and a half of math when they're like really wanting to work on identifying different flowers and fish and Mm -hmm. um, are clearly having like huge emotional responses to, you know, needing to sit and for that long. Anyway, so I made the really difficult decision to quit. Um, And at that point, I'd been... I'd gone from institution to institution, you know, like school and I was a gymnast and I was part of a lot of different organizations and, and I always had an idea of like where my next step would be. Mm -hmm. And in quitting, I was suddenly like, I just turned 22. I was 6,000 miles away from everyone that I knew. And I was just like on the island, the big island of Hawaii. And I mean, I realized that I had two choices. In that moment, like when I woke up crying, I was like, okay, I can keep on going in this direction of social prestige and keep sounding good to folks and doing this work while on the side, having this devotion to my heart and to living with a sort of singularity and oneness, devotion to my own heart's truth. And then I was, I could do that. Or, and then I was like, wait a second, with choosing the one that's just my heart's truth, like there can't be another one. So yeah, I quit. And that was like, (laughs) that was excruciating. Um, And I just remember like going the first day that I was supposed to go and teach. Like the rest of my housemates who were also teachers went and I was there. And like the space was enormous and paralyzing. And I wanted to just lay in bed and be depressed. But then I was in (laughs) Hawaii and like the palm fronds were sounding like rain outside my window and the birds were chirping and (laughs) like the traffic, you know, I was just like, oh man, I can't even be depressed. (laughs) Right. Something else was calling you out and calling you onward. 
Oh, my goodness. So I get in my car and I have rarely experienced myself talking to myself aloud. That's like not one of my one of my things. Mm -hmm. But I hear myself go, I get in the car, I go, take me where I need to go. (laughs) And I'm driving and I find myself like going toward this, like there was like a Target and Barnes and Noble and this and that. And I'm like, what the, like why? But then I keep going and I'm going behind it. And I'm like, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. But also kind of like zombie, like, because I'm so overwhelmed and numb from the experience of quitting and doing all that. I find myself at this place called Old Airport Park, I think. And essentially, it just used to be an old airport. So the parking lot is as wide as a landing strip. And on one side is the ocean. Mm. And on the other side is a lovely garden with a walking path. And I go and I sit by the ocean and my car is the only one in there. It's like 830 on a Monday morning. Mm-hmm. And I go and I'm just looking at the ocean and I'm like willing myself to feel again. Mm-hmm. Because I had just been head down, plow forward for a long time. And I knew that I couldn't feel and I'm sitting there and I'm like staring at the ocean and start writing. And I write, I know when I landed on this island, it felt alive to me, but like, where are the pulse points? And Mm. I kid you not, within one second of writing that, I hear like, a drum (laughs) from across the way. (laughs) Wow. And I look and now there's one other car in the parking lot and there is one man on the other side, sitting under a tree, playing his drum. And Mm. I was like, what the hell? (laughs) And I feel like that's the moment my life started in some ways, you know, like my life of magic and possibility and freedom. And and so I I walk over magnetized, but I don't want him to see me because I'm like a mess, like truly a mess. And I've got, I've got a Krishnamurti book and a Kurt Vonnegut book. And I just sit close enough that I could hear him, but far enough away that he can't really see me. And I sit and I pretend to read one of those books. (laughs) For like I love an it. hour or two. <laughs> yeah. And what I'm feeling is like the warmth of that rhythm melting the frozen parts inside mm. of me. And I, I finally like get to cry and, you know, like the, the melted <laughs> water just coming down my eyes and uh, I get deep breath for the first time in so long. And a few hours later, I get up to go leave and my legs just start taking me toward him. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want to see anyone right now. And they're just going and it's like, you need to thank him. I'm like, oh, so I like walk over. And as I get closer, I see that he's just like this glowing, glowing person. Wow. And I get close and he looks up at me and I'm like breath taken out of me. Mm -hmm. of like the beauty and it was the most presence I'd seen in any person's eyes in my life. Mm. He just looked at me and he's like, aloha. Mm. And everything stopped for me, you know? And I was just like, hi. Um, (laughs) I just wanted, um, I just wanted to thank you. Um, You know, I like, and I told him a little bit and he was just like, well, great. Like glad that it did that for you. Awesome. And like, it was just so chill and I was just so moved. And the next day I went again and we ended up spending the whole day together until the sun set into the ocean oh, talking wow. about, oh my God, just everything. But mm-hmm. like with a focus on like Sufism and Taoism and just ideas and theories and feelings. And it was just like so nourishing yeah. for me. I felt like I'd maybe for the first time met someone who was on the same page as me, but further down it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that, he was like, I think you may find more of what you're looking for on the other side of the Island. And like, that was it. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) So there's like, I mean, this story could be too long, so I'm going to. Oh, it's it's, it's a little bit. So great. I mean, I love the gift that he just, (laughs) I mean, probably in some ways unknowingly, but maybe he actually knew. I mean, but what a gift of just like letting you be. And just, you know, taking in what you had to say and then like, wow, what a person, what a person. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. He's, he's still one of my best friends. And that was oh. eight years ago. Amazing. Um, yeah. There are so many little intricacies to this tale. Long story shorter, <laughs> I get to the other side and it is just magic after magic after magic. I'm just astounded. I mean, I drove like on the road to the other side. I literally drove beneath a rainbow. 
wow. as I was making it to like this new town. <laughs> like what is going mm-hmm. on? Yeah, it was it was an outrageous. The world just opened up and it became colorful. And I found myself living at this organic farm kind of in the jungle. And I was living in this a, a jungle, we called it. It was just like a room on stilt green walls, plywood floor, tin roof. And in the jungle in the winter in Hawaii, it's pretty rainy. And I just sat there. I just spent so much time alone in that jungle for months, learning how to cry again and like letting the rain help with that. And this one day, this lovely woman who did a lot of the management there, she was hosting a restorative yoga class. Have you ever done restorative yoga? I have not. I've done Bikram, oh, which <laughs> actually oh, on, in Hawaii as well. <laughs> Strangely, with oh, I, I started with Wayne Dyer in the room. <laughs> oh, wow. So yeah, but Bikram yoga is fun, but I've never done restorative. So restorative is the pretty much the opposite of Bikram. <laughs> <laughs> which is like, in yeah, that, crazy. <laughs> yeah. Restorative is like, my, okay, so my experience with, with Tara that night was we smoked some weed and then she guided me through this practice of just like opening and relaxation really deeply and we're in this beautiful space and again with the screen walls and like the cokey frogs are chirping and Mm -hmm. I remember her like rubbing lavender oil into my feet and just like having the most blissful time and at the end of this practice I was so relaxed and open Mm. Um, that I couldn't even like think about like going back through the jungle to get to my jungle <laughs> and was like, oh, and she was like, okay, Morgan, a kirtan is happening here next and you're welcome to join. And I was like, what, what's kirtan? She was like, actually, she was like, I'd love if you stayed. I was like, what is that? She's like, it's a, it's devotional singing. And I was like, oh, like I, I don't sing. I, yeah, that I don't, I don't do that. And she's like, okay, well just, um, come and you know, sit with us. It'll be, it'll be really sweet. And I I couldn't move. So I didn't really have a choice. I was just like so tired and relaxed. And yeah. So then there are like five or six of us sitting around this single flame and these songs are being sung and I'm becoming really hypnotized by it in a great way. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I start to hear this, this voice, this woman singing and was just oh well, my goodness, that's one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. Who is that? And I look up and I'm looking around. Mm-hmm. I need to know who that is because I've been obsessed with people who could sing. That mm-hmm. from like my earliest memories. It was like, I just thought it was the most incredible thing. And the voice stopped. And that happens like over the next hour, like three or four more times where I'm like, who is that? And then it stops. And finally, a woman sitting next to me is like, why do you keep stopping? And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit. Like, this means, oh, my God. And in that moment, and this is crazy, but this is what happened for me. In that moment, I was, I have to, now I have to do this for my life. Like, this is it now. Um, <laughs> and, like, for somebody with no, with, with, like, first of all, no desire, uh, at like an anti-desire to be in front of people. Yeah. Not interested. No, thank you. With that and, like, no training and anything to all of a sudden have like the feeling of just like now this is your life and this will be your living too and I was like what (laughs) so it took a couple of years after that to like really start I mean I was just so scared I was just terrified thinking I am you know as recently as my last year of college I remember reading this um article that it was either I think Alicia Keys had been interviewed and she was talking about going through a really rough time and climbing to like the top of a pyramid in Egypt and just singing her heart out and like yeah and I remember thinking like if I could just sing I think I could be okay because I was going through a really rough time it was like if I could just sing I think I think I could be okay but you know that's not that's not something I can do I'd never heard my voice. I didn't sing in the shower. I remember driving um, and having music really loud and singing with it and like every so often trying to trick myself and lower the volume very quickly so that I could hear (laughs) what I sounded like. Because I was like, I think maybe I'm doing it. But I would just quiet. And this was alone. I was shy with myself. So I've had to cry so much (laughs) 
and like to overcome like the terror of it. Yeah. So anyway, that's how I started. That's, oh my goodness. I'm, I'm just, I'm just sitting here like amazed and delighted. Like what a journey and what a journey both to like, to what you knew you, it sounds like you maybe already knew you wanted to do, but then also the journey inward of becoming comfortable with what that meant that you would rise into this, this thing that is you. The whole thing's beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I didn't know I wanted, it felt like something that I was like, if there are next lives, like, let me be able to sing in my next life. So it wasn't mm-hmm. like this thing ever that I was like, I want to be a singer. That right. felt way too, <laughs> that just was like, no, it was just, that's amazing. <laughs> that's out way outside of the realm of anything I could do. I love that you've shared all that because I think so many creative people, what, there's such vulnerability and being creative and sharing a bit of what is clearly your soul with other people that it is, I mean, there's terror involved. There's been even, I mean, like even conversations that I've had on the podcast, like sometimes I'm like, I got to ask that question. And I'm like, I can't ask that question. Uh (laughs) You know, it's it's terrifying because you're putting yourself out there in a way that's so, what, visible and vulnerable. Oh my gosh. crazy. It's everything. And like before this, I did not do anything artistic. Um, In fact, I avoided plague. Like, Mm -hmm. I remember being in first grade. So I was newly six years old and getting a prompt for journal writing time that just said free write. And I watched, like, the other kids around me be kind of stoked on that. And I watched myself just, like, freeze up. And, like, I wonder if that's the first time I lied because I was like, I need to go to the bathroom. And then I just, like, walked around the halls. Mm. Um, and was like, I'm going to come back when this is over, because if I don't know how to do this right, if you're not like, I don't know how to win this. I don't know how to do that, do it correctly. This is way too much. And so I avoided all forms of creative expression. And I just did the like, like things that could be quantified. Right. You know, like I did things that looked good on paper and that there was like a clear good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like way to measure like you're succeeding. Yeah. So it's a massive, massive change, of course. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And can relate so, so deeply to so much of it because yeah, definitely even my own self, you know, perfectionist tendencies and a good student and felt really safe and confident in the areas where I knew like, yeah, I can do that. That's I've got Mm -hmm. it. But then, yeah, anything that seems a little bit more like, okay, I'm going to have to reveal a bit of myself or share something else. Yeah. That's, that's a terrifying proposition. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and then doing it like my kind of first step into that was I started actually that same woman Tara asked if she could see some of what I was writing, which I had mm-hmm. just started writing at that point, and I was kind of like, okay. And she read and she was like, okay, well you need to share this with the world. And I was like, uh, mm-hmm. da, 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 no. <laughs> and at the time, like I was really, and I still am actually, experiments in fearlessness or like boldness and just if something I was a little bit more black and white about it in the beginning but it was kind of like if something scares me Mm -hmm. and it seems to pertain to like my my growth I just have to do it yeah and I yeah I mean I don't mean that in the way of like if there's like a zip line that I'm like that doesn't seem safe (laughs) (laughs) yeah but so I make this blog It, it was called the unraveling and I started to write about my experience of completely leaving the stability and certainty of what I knew and just moving to this organic farm in the jungle and exploring what it means to like for me to really be fully alive. Mm. And uh, yeah, they had like a few thousand readers around the world within a year. And it was it was a really cool and totally scary experience. So I feel like that was the first kind of exercise in that. And then then the music <laughs> Then the music. Well, then the music. Well, and I feel like there's there's such a through story here around, I don't know, what then your song, Mary Oliver, about that moment where you realize you're going to be something or someone that maybe is different than what everyone has told you. I don't. It sounds mm-hmm. like that has a great resonance with what you've just explained as your story. I don't know if you want to get into where those lyrics how, came from or, you know, like how did how yeah. did that song come to be? So Mary Oliver is about me (laughs) Um, and yeah, it's my story. And I remember sitting with a friend a little bit before, before writing that named Jonah Matranga, who has been writing songs for a very long time. And he, 
said to me, like, Morgan, like, I'd love to hear a song about your story. I think you're a lot more interesting than you may think. <laughs> mm. A little while after that, I was sitting on my bed, guitar next to me, and like kind of just like blankly Facebook scrolling, which, you know, not proud, but that's, that's what happened. And I saw a picture of an old classmate, someone that I'd gone, gone to school with from preschool through high school. And she was always really sweet. We were never very close, um, but she was always sweet and lovely. And in this photo, well, I saw the status first and it was like something that seemed really like, wow, like over the top to me, like of Mm -hmm. all of the quantifiable achievements that had been reached in a short amount of time. And it was like a picture of her and her new husband. And they're in like the pregnant pose, like he's behind her hands on her belly. And they're in Mm -hmm. front of this like fancy looking mantelpiece. And it's like, wow, like bought a house and this new car and became a doctor and got married. And um, we're doing this. And that all happened in a year. And oh, my, you know, and uh, I was like, wow, like, cool. That's all great. And then like, of course, beneath that is like all the like, oh, my gosh, congratulations. And That's like, I have no issue with that sort of thing. And then I looked closer at the photo and I looked at her and was just like, oh my goodness, like, where is she? Mm. Where, oh my goodness, where did she go? I was so haunted by the look in her eyes. Um, Like her mouth was still smiling, Mm -hmm. but she just looked so different. And so I took some time and I looked through some photos of her and I like was wondering when that happened. Wow, oh my yeah. goodness, when and I'm just watching her like her spirit retreat into like a back corner of herself. And of course, this is my judgment. This is my perception of what I'm seeing. And then I looked at up another friend who I had like a similar thought about and I just looked and was just wow. And then I just picked up my guitar and it came out in one moment like this. We're all getting older. So what's it gonna be? You know? Mm. And yes. like the next line then came and I was just like, okay, wow. And, you know, within a few days, the whole song was written. And I thought like, oh, yeah, like Jonah had suggested I tell my story. Like this weaves in quite well. So I just start as simply as possible writing my own story. And when the pre-chorus, what are you going to do? So originally it was, I just heard that quote. Right. I I didn't even know the poem. But I did know that it was from Mary Oliver and I knew that I loved it. And I was like, wow, I'm I'm amazed that this Mary Oliver line is asking to be part of my song. How (laughs) cool is that? I'm Mm going to name this song Mary Oliver. Like, that's so neat. So what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? And yeah, I was just tickled by that. And how cool. Yeah. And I got this like feeling, this little like. I don't know, invisible hand tapping on my shoulder being like, you should check with Mary Oliver (laughs) if this is okay. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I think that this song might have some reach. And Mm. I was kind of like, what? Like, you know, this is like my third song I ever wrote or, you know, something close to that. Mm -hmm. I was like, so I write her people and I write this like effusive, (laughs) like best written letter I could write. And they get back to me right away. Um, oh, wow. And we're like, yeah, Mary's not okay with that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, dang. So what I did was I changed the line a little tiny bit. And I kept the song called Mary Oliver. <laughs> wow. I changed it to vast and precious life. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. In order to respect her wishes and at the same time, like kept the song titled Mary Oliver to give a nod over to her. Um, Mm -hmm. But so that's how that, that's how that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Well, and such an, such a different take on, I mean, cause I think in what social media, it's so easy. Everything's so curated. Everything's so presented as mostly like, this is the best foot forward or whatever. And such an interesting take on the, I don't know, like your read on it, like that that led somewhere so different and recognizing, mm-hmm. I don't know, what came up for you and wondering, okay, but what happened to these people? Yeah, my heart was sad. Yeah. I was just like, where, where? And I mean, as a child, I I, I thought we were all on the same page of mm-hmm. like looking at the adults around whose lights were very 
dampened seeming and who were like often really stressed and shut down. And I, I thought it was an unspoken understanding that we were going to do it differently. Yeah. Um, I really, and I truly like, I thought it was a fact. I truly believed it. Like, oh yeah, like we are not going to just recreate the same thing again and again. And then I was just like, so genuinely shocked as we got older. And I like would talk to different friends and they'd be like, yeah, well, I'm going into this field because, you know, like, no, I, I mean, I hate it, but I need Mm -hmm. to. And I was like, oh my gosh, maybe I should have not had that been unspoken and start like, I started thinking about that in kindergarten, you know, like maybe Mm -hmm. I should have been talking to all these people about this, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's so interesting. I mean, as you were saying that, I was thinking like, I know I, that moment that you talked about seeing that in your friend's picture was like, I I was like, I remember feeling that in a previous marriage where I was like, oh Mm. crap, (laughs) I've landed Mm -hmm. in that place where I did not want to be. And, and kind of looking around and wondering, okay, what is it that I want to do with this vast and precious life? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, and I think we probably all, each of us have that moment where either the line can be inspirational of like driving us forward, but it also is kind of cauterizing in a way because you're like, oh crap, I did, I'm not living up to it. And so I love that it mm-hmm. it found its way into your song kind of in both those ways too. Totally. Yeah. It's yeah. I hope, I hope Mary's okay with it. I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I like respect her so much. Yeah. Um, the song, I mean, it, so I made a music video mm-hmm. with yeah five other women and this and it went viral which was shocking Mm. it's been viewed like I think like 240,000 times wow or something and like with no like I've never sponsored it I've never marketed it like this is all just organic Mm -hmm. and you know I've gotten like such profound feedback from hundreds of people Mm -hmm. that I'm like yeah I hope that I like really hope that Mary's not mad and I might like I'm willing to accept if she is, yeah. Um, because this has just opened up so much for so many people. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's almost it feels like it's part, as obviously as a total outsider, but it also feels like it's it's part of what happens when people are creative. You put it out there to share with someone, and then it's going to always take on its own interpretation and its own mm-hmm. life once you've released it to the wild, whatever that means. So, yeah. Mm, well, I'm, I'm glad that uh, that you sang it at the Danielle Laporte thing. And that moment of you singing it in a cathedral, like everything about that was just beautiful. Sacred spaces need more of that realism. Um, and it was really, it was really beautiful to behold it. So thank you. Thank you. Mm. I would love to learn more about how you met or came in contact with Danielle Laporte and got to play at Grace Cathedral. So it was like a moment of like extreme courage, pretty much on my part. I was, I saw an ad pop up, um, like Danielle Laporte, Grace Cathedral, two weeks. And just, I didn't even think, I couldn't even think. And I just like, this all happened in two minutes, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just went and I wrote (laughs) to her, like I found an email address and I I wrote to her staff and, or her or whatever. And it was just like, I have a song. Um, Here's the video. And I, I can't like believe this sort of (laughs) the courage it took, but I was just like, I think this will enhance your event. Mm. Um, Because in my heart, I really did believe that, but there was also so much like, terror that it's like what are you talking about like you can't say that but and then I sent it and then I totally forgot completely because it was just a moment right and two or three days before (laughs) I get an email Mm -hmm. and it was just like hey Danielle would love to have you come and open up the show (laughs) and I like my jaw dropped I was like oh my god what no, I mean, I've been following her work for like seven years. Right. Um, I was just like, oh, and yeah, that was, talk about resistance and fear. Mm-hmm. Playing, that was, I was, I was beyond afraid. Mm. Really. It was, <laughs> that was a big leap, but it was one that I knew in my heart I needed to take. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and being in the audience for it, you you are right that we all needed to hear that song that day um, oh. and that it enhanced the event. Um, oh. I mean, because just sitting there, like I said, in the space, in a very sacred space, you set a tone of what will happen here and what is permitted and who we are permitted to be. And so I, I could not tell if you were terrified. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that part did not I come tried. across. <laughs> You yeah, cried? I, I tried my best oh, to just, yeah. oh, no, I said I tried my best yeah. to just root in. Oh, I definitely cried, but that was yeah. later. <laughs> no, it was magnificent. I mean, every, everything about it was, was the, the right thing for that place and that time. And, and you were meant to be there. It was gorgeous. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Yes. It was beautiful. I'm glad you shared that, that especially with the terror. <laughs> I think it's just such an encouragement for other people to be like, I can do this. I'm going to get right on through it <laughs> and see what can so happen. So much terror. I made yeah. what I call um, sober decisions, which have nothing to do with like any like traditional mm-hmm. intoxicants, but like I consider fear mm-hmm. an intoxicant yeah. and anxiety and intoxicant. And so like, if I had not decided before arriving at Grace Cathedral that I would absolutely be getting on that stage and playing that song, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have happened because everything in my body in that moment was being like, run, like, Don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like I'm in no place to make decisions when that's happening. So I just mm-hmm. rooted into that. Like, nope, this is, this is the choice. What else are you working on or what else is dear to your heart after having you know, put the Mary Oliver song out there, what else has come up and what are you doing? Well, one of the things that's like really on the horizon for me that I'm really excited um, to step into is holding space for other women to feel safe to explore their voices. I mean, it's so loaded. I, I don't even know where to really start, but like even through the lens of feminism or especially through the lens of feminism, like women making noise, like step one, that's scary. Mm -hmm. Singing is something that so many people are afraid of. For me, like, here's the sound of my soul. I'm like turning myself inside out and here's the sound of it. So I really want to create spaces and have a workshop, like a five or six week workshop with small groups where we explore the voice. And, you know, I give technical support, but more than anything, it's just a place to feel really safe and explore and even talk about like, you know, so when's the first time someone told you that you couldn't sing? And how Mm. did that actually feel? Yeah. Um, You know, because there's so many people walking around being like, oh, I'm tone deaf. Uh, Not for me. And like actually pausing there and being like, who told you that? When? Like, do you want to sing? Because it's not like, you know, in our culture, we've created this thing where the artists, the only ones that we see are the ones on stages, right? big stages, who have already put in so much time practicing and learning, but we're not really shown that. Like, it's just um, like, I remember watching Sister Act as mm-hmm. a kid and seeing like, you know, that one nun who ended up like singing like amazingly and like Whoopi just like <laughs> yes. pressing on her diaphragm. Yeah, going from like blah 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 to like hey, hey you know, like just like like really like and so just thinking like, oh, so people are born being able to sing like Whitney Houston or they aren't singers. And I think mm-hmm. that that's so prohibitive and for people and debilitating even because it just no, like Whitney Houston wasn't born singing like Whitney Houston. She I'm sure had tons of lessons and tons of time not sounding great. So I just want to presence that for people too. Mm -hmm. Like that the voice is an instrument and it needs to be practiced just like any other instrument. And I feel like there's this big like wrong belief in our culture that people can either sing or they can't. And that's just not how I feel at all. Yeah. And I love that observation and kind of tapping into what that kind of that larger theme too of we see the same group of people the famous people all doing this stuff all the time and then we -hmm. don't see the work that they did behind the scenes to get them to where they're famous or known or whatever so much just seems insurmountable when when then you see a whitney houston you're like well yeah there's no way i can do that look at her how long has she been training so i'm really excited about Mm -hmm. about creating and holding that space that sounds just so enlivening and 
So mm-hmm. part of what happened with the Mary Oliver video is I got hundreds of messages from women, actually, like all around the world, and them telling me it's being used in their like women's circles, and can I get the chords for this? I want to learn it. And it got me thinking more deeply about a problem that I, like, do I want to call Yeah, it is a problem, a problem that like really impacted me a lot throughout my life that I'm feeling just significantly more free within. Mm -hmm. which is um, women, body, and food, and that relationship. And so I'm really wanting to also create a circle for that because I feel like it's something that's just so infrequently spoken about Mm -hmm. and that if people aren't super, like, severely disordered, they don't think that there's, like, like, it's just considered normal to be Mm -hmm. fixated on the size of our bodies and the shapes of our bodies. And I want to challenge that and hold space for women to heal. Oh, I like that too. And there's, I see such an amazing tie in there with like, it's what, it's not just the outer voices or our own using our voice, but it's kind of like that inner voice that says, I'm not good enough. And that's why I'm going to do this. Yeah. It's all still voice and in that realm. And yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) the inner critic. Oh, hello, inner critic. Oh, the inner critic. (laughs) Well, let's jump to the last couple questions. Do you want to tell people where they can find out a little bit more about you if they are curious? I feel like a great place to just like jump onto the journey is Instagram. Awesome. Yeah, I, I go in and out of <laughs> posting lots, um, but there and Facebook, Facebook or Instagram and Facebook are good spots. Awesome. I will link your handles in the show notes, folks. Where have you seen resistance come up in your life and how have you overcome it? But like a resistance that I'm like really confronting right now. And mm-hmm. this is just so, well, I don't want to judge it, but it's so hard not to. Mm-hmm. Is I have a resistance to to working really hard in certain ways, like in creative ways. So like planning the tour, like that was super hard work and I had no resistance to it. But like learning how to do this new thing on the guitar there's all this stuff that comes up and be like, I should just like, you should just be able to do that. I have resistance to trying my very hardest in my creative pursuits. There's some sort of bullshit safety, I feel, in being like, well, yeah, I'm all self-taught. And, and then getting the like, wow. And then having it be like, in my head, like, and yeah, like, I could be a lot better if I worked really, really hard. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. it's, just, it's like the same thing as being like a kid in school and being like, well, I got, you know, I got a 95 on that exam, uh, but I didn't study. Yeah, I can't, I get yeah. what you're, what you're saying there. I mean, cause uh, for me, podcasting, not that it's the same exactly, but it, like uh, almost all the stuff I do, I, I taught myself how to do this. I know how to edit files mm-hmm. and but then there was this resistance for me that came up about like, well, if I hire an editor, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, like there's something like more honorable or more grassroots or something about being the person that then is doing it all herself. But that's that's a false. I think that's what you're saying about the Mm -hmm. kind of the BS part of it is like that there's something false about that because it's not it's not true that I'm a better podcaster because I edit my own files. That's strange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I want to get more specific on the BS. It's like, I I think what it boils down to for me is that if I try my very best and I not, and I'm not the best, which is so arbitrary and ridiculous and bullshit, Mm -hmm. um, then like, how do I cope with that? So it's easier for me to be like, well, I'm not trying my very best. So like even hearing myself say it, I feel sad in my Mm -hmm. heart. Like, oh. Well, so and right I think now I'm working on that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think awareness is like part of it. And then, I mean, it sounds like the path is there for you. Like, you know, you want to, to get through it and past it. So mm. I just have yeah. a lot of resistance, though, for sure. Um, <laughs> and then the other like resistance that I experienced was I talked about earlier of just singing at all and yeah. expressing at all. I felt like I had. Like, I didn't even know I had valves of expression because they were so calcified. Mm -hmm. And so pushing, like, kind of dissolving that calcification, like, note by note and, like, having so 
and it just being the scariest thing, even by myself. And then like singing in front of people for the first time, I lost feeling in my whole body, truly. And then I had such a severe reaction to like the tension that I got like a sciatic pinch and I couldn't walk for a week. So like true, true terror. So like tons of resistance to, and you know, I guess when it comes down to it, like fully, fully actualizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And is that maybe the heart of like everyone's resistance? In some way, like that, mm. that full actualization of who I know I'm here to be. It could be. I wonder if it's um, coming from a similar place or what, because for me, I think it's coming from like, if I try my best, like I said, if I try my best and I'm not the best, like, who am I? Like, what? <laughs> like, then what? Yeah. Um, the- mm, yeah, that's, that's really rich territory of that kind of actualization and self-trust. So the last question I ask everyone is, um, what are three ways that you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life, in the world, or in other people's lives? I think one one thing that comes to mind right away is to find little joys because it can seem really daunting, that question. Like, I think if taken in like, okay, how to feel this big sense of enduring joy. So like if having flowers in the house brings you joy go get go get a bouquet of flowers so like little little ways and then that's one thinking about hugs <laughs> <laughs> i'm a total hugger i love it <laughs> i'm thinking about hugs and then i think just putting intentional time like setting intentional time which i think in our super busy lives can be really like hard really hard to do but setting time and being like okay for this hour even once a week. First, I'll explore and like see what does bring me joy. And then, you know, if you find it, commit, make it an actual commitment, put it on your schedule, make it as important as paying this or that bill or taking your kid here or there, like make it a, making it a priority. Yeah. And recognizing that connecting with joy will actually enhance the lives of the people around you. And like it, that it'll bleed into so many other places in your life in a positive and helpful way. Oh, I love them all. Mm. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been just amazing and wonderful. Yay. Yeah, it's really been fun. Um, Morgan, thank you so much for being on the show. And I'm so glad we got to look back at this lesson together. Um, It was just such a treat to meet you and to have you on the podcast. I really am inspired by your story and how you said yes to that thing that you knew you had to follow, even though it seemed so, I don't know, frightening and improbable and like you weren't quite sure where it would lead you. So thank you for saying yes. If you guys want to find out more about Morgan, you can find the show notes for this episode at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N. And you'll see links to her album and her website. And uh, you can also, I know she is still doing those very small concerts. So if you want to find out more, you can go over to her site too. Next week on the show, I'm really excited. We will go back to a brand new conversation this coming week with Jill Stanton, who is of the website Screw the 9 to 5. And we have a very lively and hilarious discussion about her journey to becoming an entrepreneur, which started with a skincare website and then grew so far beyond that. She and her husband, Josh, now lead screw the 9 to 5com and they have an amazing community called Screw You, which is Screw University. Anyway, you're just, (laughs) she's just so much fun to talk to. And I know you're going to love that conversation. So I hope you'll come on back for that. Um, And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy.
precious life. Press your ear up against your soul and listen hard, 'cause we're all getting older. So. Up your wings.